Come on, well, it's good to be here. Just pop your hand up again if, if you're new or this is your first time or you just started coming recently. Yay, come on. It's really good to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this evening. It's really good to have you and you're so welcome and it's so good to have you with us. So um, I've just come back from Pittsburgh uh, in America. Thank you. I want to say thank you to the church for releasing me to go. I know, uh, I know I'm paid to be here and I'm not necessarily doing much good for you while I'm over there, but thank you for releasing me to go. But just want you to know that it was an amazing time and not only were we really privileged to be able to be used by God to minister to a bunch of uh, leaders and people there, but God actually really uh, did a deep work in me as well and I just wanted to just encourage you that God's really on the move. God's really doing a lot in our, uh, in our house, um, in our leadership team. We're hearing lots and lots of testimonies at the moment about God really putting his finger on some you know, specific areas and really kind of taking us further, taking us deeper. There was a, a guy there, um, a guy called Joey, who's taking over as the, the senior leader. They're in transition at the moment. And, and it's really interesting just for me, uh, being with him, uh, himself and myself, we're in very similar kind of seasons at the moment with taking over, um, we're in transition at the moment and Stu and Chloe are taking a step up as our senior leaders and Abby and myself are kind of in transition taking over the, the leadership of the local church and he's in a pretty much identical position and his uh, dad is uh, the senior leader there um, with, with Pastor Barbara and it was just amazing being able to speak to him, he's uh, older and wiser and was just really able to minister to me and there was one amazing moment and I, and I say this just to encourage you that you know one phrase, if it's straight from the throne room of heaven, can literally change your life. And, and, and uh, I was preaching on the, the school of ministry a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking, um, talking about how to deal with disappointment. And, and we were looking at when God said no to David about building the temple uh, in Second Samuel, I think it is. And, um, and I was saying, you know, one word from God is so much better than a thousand words from man, even when that one word is no. And what do we do when we hear a no? And I just want to encourage you that actually just what we're seeing at the moment is God is dealing with a lot of people and just saying something really very simple. You know, I think so often we're looking for the, you know, uh, we're looking for the, the voice in the fire or the voice in the wind or the voice in the earthquake. And actually we're noticing at the moment that he's ministering to a lot of people with that still small voice. And this guy, Joey, this, this pastor was able to say just one phrase to me that literally wrecked me. It literally just spoke to the very depths of who I am and was really ministering to a big area of insecurity that I was carrying that I didn't realize I was carrying. And you could tell it was massive because I didn't speak for about half an hour. And everyone was like, dude, are you okay? Because like for me not to speak, I speak more than that even when I'm asleep. Like I talk more regularly than half an hour when I'm sleeping. And um, you know, ask, ask Samuel, he'll tell you we've, uh, we live together. <laughs> And so I just say that to encourage you that actually, you know, so often, you know, sometimes God does speak in the, in the big voice and, you know, he's in the fire or the wind or the earthquake. But more often than not, we're finding at the moment he's actually working in our lives through that still small voice. And actually one phrase from the throne of heaven can literally turn your life upside down, inside out, back to front. So let's just, let's be believing for that. Let's be a people that are obviously looking for the, for the sovereign move of God, but also aware that he can just say one thing and literally change our lives. Amen. Amen. Okay, right, I'm going to use this because I think I've lost, lost my lectern. <laughs> Does anyone want to volunteer to just come in and uh, hold my iPad for an hour? I'm not going to preach for an hour, don't worry. Okay, so we're looking, um, we're carrying on our series of the miracles of Jesus. And I've said this at the start of every, um, every session we've done on this, just because I'm very aware that uh, a lot of the, the topics we're preaching on are, are topics that are going to be very familiar to you. And, and I think sometimes, you know, that whole familiarity can breed contempt thing. We, we, we pass it through our filter of, I've, I've been there, I've done that, I've read this, I know this story. So I want to challenge all of us just to kind of have that mind that actually we're going to see something fresh this evening. So why don't you guys just hold out your hands, just close your eyes. God obviously doesn't speak unless you close your eyes and hold out your hands, so that's why we do that. So that's a joke. Gosh, you loosen up. You can laugh in church. It's fine. And just ask God, just, you know, he can, he can bring, he can speak with the specificity required to meet each and every person where they're at this evening. Whether you've been a Christian your whole life, whether you've been a Christian five minutes, he can take the same phrase, he can take the same word. That's, you know, he says the word is living and active, and that's what it does. When the word is living and active, it can meet you exactly where you're at. So why don't you just ask him for a fresh touch this evening, to see something fresh of who he is. A fully infinite God, I would propose to you that you have not seen every aspect of his nature. And so why don't you just ask him, even now, just for something fresh. Not because he's changed, but because you've changed. 
Not because he's suddenly going to do something new, but because you've become new. You've been made new. And so you're positioned to see something. Amen? Okay, wonderful. We have a slightly less wobbly lectern. Okay, let's do this. So, wow, it's quiet tonight. There's summer. It's summer. I heard someone say it's, it's summer, which means summer here, summer not. But uh, <laughs> let's be believing. Oh, gosh, the old ones are the good ones. There we go. It was fun as well. It, being in Pittsburgh, I, I, I love my wife and children very much. I have a, a three-year-old, soon-to-be-four-year-old, and a two-year-old, a one-year-old, soon-to-be-two-year-old. And, and it, I really did miss them. I was away for nine days. Everyone say, ah. Oh. I had the best welcome back. Like my kids just, you know, sometimes when you haven't seen, sometimes I come home and I'm really excited to see my kids and they just could not be bothered. The fact that I've walked through the door and that's hard. But this was amazing because they were like, daddy, and it was amazing. But I did enjoy being in Pittsburgh um, on my own without, uh, you know, doing things that parents of small children don't get to do very often, like, you know, go to the toilet on your own and that sort of thing. So that was amazing. That was a real treat. But um, that's good. Just the other thing I just felt prophetically just to say you know, the prophetic's really ramping up in our house at the moment. We're really pursuing the prophetic. I want to honor Rob. I've, I've done this a few times. He sent me another word that was completely, I just texted him and said, uh, I'm just uh, just about to speak. Will you, I'm just ha- having a bit of a wobble was what I said. And just, it, it was this insecurity thing I was telling you about just now. Would you just listen to God and see what he says? And he sent me back three pages and it was probably the most accurate prophetic word I've ever received. So I want to honor you. You're amazing, amazing, amazing man of God. But you know, God is really ramping it up and really, really upping the bar with the prophetic. And, and when we were there on one of the evenings through the team, we were asking for words of knowledge and we were deliberately being specific and we were able to release a number of prophetic words. We had uh, one where uh, we got the, the address of the person. So we got the number of the house and we got uh, the fact that they were uh, holding women's meetings in their house and that God was going to start releasing angelic visitations. And this lady came up and was like, that's my address. That's my number of my house. And we've been holding women's meetings. And this last week, I've been praying that God would release the angelic. And so that kind of level of accuracy. And, and God's really on that at the moment. So again, why don't you just hold up your hands? We'll do two ministry times before we've even started yet. You should eagerly desire the gift of prophecy. We're not all called to hold the office of prophet, but you are all called to eagerly desire the gift of prophecy. And it's a gift that's rooted in love. So if you don't eagerly desire the gift of prophecy right now, why don't you just ask God to just release more love into your heart for his bride? More love into your heart for your fellow brother and sister. Why? So that you can tune in accurately. It's the birthright of every believer to hear the voice of the Father. So you can tune in accurately And to be like that guy Joey was to me, to be the vessel, to be the mouthpiece for the king, to say one word that could literally change their life. God, we want the prophetic. We want to eagerly desire the prophetic, but we want to be accurate with that. We want to have prophetic words, God, so accurate that people cannot deny that they have come from a king who knows everything about us. Hmm. Amen? Okay, come on. That's good. So we're going to be um, looking at John 2 tonight. Why don't you grab your Bibles? We'll start by reading it. That's probably a good place. Who brought their Bible to church? We once went to a uh, Jackie Pullinger seminar, and we'd heard that apparently uh, a couple of weeks prior to that, she'd been teaching a, a how to read your Bible workshop. And apparently, I heard this third hand, so I, don't, I can't you know, speak to the veracity of this, but this is apparently what happened is uh, at the start of this uh, seminar on how to read your Bible, she said, who here didn't bring their Bible? And you know, kind of 20, 30% of the room stuck their hands up, and she said, get out. <laughs> and just made them leave the room. She was like, don't you come to a Bible seminar and not bring your Bible. And we heard about this, and then we were going to one of her other seminars. So we took, like, pocket Bible. I took my study Bible. I took my, I took my youth Bible that I hadn't read for, like, five years. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's bring our Bibles to church. Amen? Okay, John 2. No condemnation if you didn't bring your Bible to church. We'll just assume you memorize the whole thing. It's all good. Don't worry. <laughs> Just hold up your phone, be like, it's on my phone, and then just download the app on your way home so you've got you know, integrity with that. John 2, <laughs> Jesus changes water to wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was also there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. 
They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Come on. That's surprising to see a thus in the NIV. That was a nice treat. Jesus turning the water into wine. What's an Essex girl's favorite wine? I want to go to Lakeside. (laughs) That one was for Samuel. He's from Essex. No disrespect if you're from Essex. Okay, so the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. I uh, just want to set the scene for this, just so you guys are kind of you know, aware of, of what we're looking at here. Gospel of John is, is different to the, the other three synoptic Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of John was written much later, after the fall of Jerusalem, and, and very much the audience that the, the three synoptic Gospels were written for, it was a different audience that John was writing for. He was reading, uh, writing for kind of the, the, the Greeks and, the, and, the, and the, the Romans and that sort of thing. It wasn't necessarily aimed at the Jews. And so that's why we don't see any of the birth narrative uh, in John. We don't see any of the genealogy of Jesus, you know, the so-and-so begat so-and-so and and begat so-and-so and and all the begats and the begots. Um, And John's gospel takes a a different kind of theme, a different kind of uh, pace. uh, And he identifies seven signs, which are are miracles. He, He just highlights seven miracles. And all of those miracles serve a purpose in identifying who Jesus is. So whereas the, the, the focus of the Synoptic Gospels was, uh, was um, establishing the birth right of Christ, you know, his, his lineage, you know, the root of Jesse and the, and the, the, you know, the granddaughter of so-and-so, you know, establishing his, his Jewish uh, right to be the Messiah, as it were, you know, and all of the prophetic fulfillments. Who was here when we did Jesus in the Old Testament? Do you remember that series? And we looked at all of the, you know, the, the, the references to Jesus in the Old Testament and how the whole of the Old Testament was kind of weaving this tapestry so that the Jews would see Messiah when he arrived. Whereas John takes a very different approach. And what he's doing in his gospel is presenting Jesus to people that wouldn't have had an understanding uh, of what the concept of the Messiah was. Does that make sense? So I just wanted to say that just to kind of set the scene a little. And so there's seven signs. And also in John, there's seven I am statements. And you'll remember, won't you, Jesus making the I am statements was a big part of what got him into a lot of trouble with the, with the, um, the, the Jewish people because to say I am, only God says that. When, when God meets Moses with the burning bush, I am who I am. And so to say I am is, to, is, is a claim of divinity. And so there's seven I am statements. I am the bread of life, John 6. I am the light of the world, John 8. I am the door of the sheep, John 10. I am the good shepherd, somewhere else in John, John 10, I think. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life in John 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. And then in uh, the, the last one, the seventh I am statement is, I am the true vine in John 15. And this miracle uh, is connected with that statement, I am the vine. And so as we're looking at this, I just want to unpack a few themes. But I really want to encourage you, and I say this a lot. I don't know who actually does this, but maybe you could feedback. That would be amazing and very much encouraging. Um, but I really want to encourage you to take this away and to study this to actually go away and to dig deeper, not study with the mind. You know, Jesus uh, said, you know, you, you diligently study the scriptures because you think in them you will have life, but you refuse to come to me. You know, I'm not talking about studying with the mind, but I'm talking about meditating on this, taking this away, chewing it over, really going deeper into the word. You know, the word is, is, is the word of God, yeah? The Bible is the word of God. It's God breathed. And so there's so much for us to find. So I want to encourage you, just nudge your neighbor and say, do some homework. <laughs> so we're going to go through this. Uh, verse by verse and kind of pull this apart, pull out some themes. So if you keep your Bibles, keep your Bibles open um, and then we'll we'll, we'll go through it verse by verse. So verse one, why don't we read verse one together? On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Okay, so you know this is the only gospel account to include the wedding at Cana and there's so much significance even in the third day. Think about it, what happened on the third day? Yeah, he rose again, and it's interesting, uh, John, uh, John 1 and John, uh, through John 1, and, and prior to, to this account at the start of John 2, uh, it talks about on the first day, you know, uh, the, the, it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. It talks about that, and so first off, John establishes Jesus as 
preeminent. You know, we were singing about that, weren't we? You know, the preeminence of Christ. You know, he was, he was before all things. And then it says on the second day, it establishes him as the Lamb of God. Because, you know, where John, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we see Jesus established as the Godhead. We see him established as the Lamb. And then this third day, we see him established as the bridegroom. Now, I know in this account, he's not the bridegroom. But we see that he is God that he came to be sacrificed for us as the Lamb of God, and then we see there's a wedding. And I love that significance, that symbolism of on the third day when he rose again, you know, it pertains to that wedding, doesn't it? What's that song you used to sing, Rob? There's going to be a wedding. It's the reason that I'm living, to marry the Lamb. You know, there's a wedding coming. There's a wedding coming. There's a wedding coming. Did you know he's coming back? Just heads up, he's coming back. Look busy, okay? Good. So <laughs> the third day, you know, the significance. In the beginning was the word, then the Lamb of God. And on the third day, we see this wedding. And you know, in Western weddings, who here is married? Who here is a, a husband? You, you will attest to this fact. What I am about to say is true. Verily, I say to you that in Western weddings, the, the, the sole focus is the bride, right? Yeah, I mean, basically, my dad's advice to me on my wedding day was stand where you're told, do what you're told, and smile when you're told. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that kind of seems a bit simplistic. He was right. Stand where you're told, do what you're told. I mean, pretty much that's, you know, you could just take that into marriage, I guess. Stand where you're told, do what you're told. And, you know, <laughs> now I wear the trousers in my marriage. She just tells me which pair and when to put them on. So it's all good. But, you know, the focus of a Western wedding is, is the bride. We've got Zach and Shanice's wedding coming up soon. Yay! And Zach, I hate to tell you this, but really the focus is going to be Shanice at that day. You will probably get a small look in. You might even get a mention. I think you get some lines. I think I do or something like that. But the sole, the sole focus of a Western wedding is, is the bride. She's, she's, she's the focus. Everyone comes to see the bride. She's the one who gets the magnificent entrance. But in, in this culture, in this wedding, actually the bride wouldn't have been the focus. The bridegroom would be the focus. He would be the one. Yeah, I know, right? And so, you know, this is... He would have been the one that footed the bill. He would have been the one that paid for the wedding. And in this picture of seeing Jesus as the bridegroom, who's the one that pays for the wedding? Jesus. He's the one that pays the price. He's the one that paid the dowry, the dowry that has to be paid for the purchase of the bride, okay? Who do you pay the dowry to for the purchase of the bride? The father of the bride, okay? And so when Jesus went to the cross, he was paying that dowry for us. The dowry that my father demanded for my middle sister was a packet of crisps and a pint of lager. That was the dowry that he, uh, he said for my sister. I hope she doesn't know that because that would be really devaluing perhaps. But the, uh, she's the middle child, it's fine. But the, um, the, 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 the point is, in, the, in, in this picture where we see Jesus, of course, it's the setting and he's not the bridegroom in this. But in, in this culture, they would have understood that a wedding, the focus of the wedding is the bridegroom. Okay, He's the one that pays the price. He's the one that makes the preparations. Were you here when I was speaking on Genesis 22 and 24 with uh, Eleazar being sent to find the bride? Uh, it, when, when Abraham and, and Isaac um, on, the, on the mountain, do you remember that? Okay, quick recap. Abraham and Isaac on the mount is a prophetic picture of Jesus. Um, so when we saw Isaac climbing the, the hill with the wood on his back, that was a prophetic picture of what Jesus would later do when he climbed the hill with the wood on his back. The father sacrificing his only begotten son. So that is a prophetic picture of what we later see Jesus doing on Calvary. But in Genesis 24, Abraham sends his chief servant, who's called Eleazar, to go and find a bride for his only begotten son. Okay, and, and the word Eleazar is El, meaning God, El Shaddai, El Eleazar. Eleazar is helper. And so even in that, we see the prophetic picture of Holy Spirit being God the helper and the father sending God the helper to go and find a bride for the son that he loves. And so it's all about a wedding. It's all about preparing that bride. We're all on this process of being prepared. We're all on this process of being made to look more like the one that we're going to be married to. And even in that process, I've spoken on this so many times, that revelation, when we see something fresh of God, revelation means to lift the veil. We're the bride, we lift the veil, and when we see him, we're made like him. And so even in that process, it says that we are going to be like him when we see him. And so even on that wedding day, when that veil is finally lifted, when there's no more sin, there's no more tears, there's no more you know, anything that would hinder us from full relationship with him, at that point, we're going to be made fully like him. But in the process of becoming like that, we're being made more like him as well. Who knows there's a journey of sanctification we need to go on? Who knows we all need to look a bit more like Jesus? Turn to your neighbor. See? I'm right, aren't I? <laughs> you know, we all need to be made more like that bridegroom. 
And you know, one of the most powerful images of heaven is the wedding banquet. We, we read about it in Revelation 19. And the Bible ends with the, with the invitation to the marriage feast, doesn't it? That's how the Bible ends. The spirit and the bride say, come, that invitation. Revelation 21. Who wrote Revelation? And so we see even, even in this gospel account, he's painting that picture of the wedding. Verse 2. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. You know, some commentaries say that one of the reasons the wine ran out was because Jesus and his disciples basically gatecrashed the wedding. I want to say to you that verse is fairly... I don't know how people would think that when it clearly says in verse 2, they'd also been invited to the wedding. Jesus was invited, and yes, Jesus replies to connect invites and says that he's coming to events. Did you know that? That's a, that's a, for those of you who aren't part of the family, we have this system called Connect that Ellie told us about, and we really love it when you tell us you're coming to an event. It's great kind of helps our little hearts when we plan this event and then we look on and we see that three people are coming and you know two of them live in your house it's a bit upsetting so please reply to events that's really encouraging verse three when the wine was gone Jesus mother said to him they have no more wine when the wine was gone just saying verse four women woman why do you involve me Jesus replied my hour has not yet come woman why do you involve me and I used to think this was really disrespectful when I used to read this woman why do you involve me and all the feminists right now are just going like cray cray they're just like this is so disrespectful like Ellie Hodgins having kittens she's like Jesus is being so disrespectful to women and it kind of sounds honestly like when you read this woman why do you involve me this doesn't sound like the Jesus we know does it you know, the, 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 the Jesus full of meekness and kindness, you know, the, the personification of the Father who is love. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Woman, why do you involve me? It kind of sounds like he's about to go tell Mary to make him a sandwich, doesn't it? It's kind of that kind of, it, it, it seems quite disrespectful. It seems quite an abrupt way to speak to her. But actually, um, this isn't a great translation. When he says woman, there, there's two things that are going on here. The first is that it's actually a, a, a lot more respectful than we would, than, than, it, than it sounds in English. English doesn't do this phrase a lot of good. Actually, th- this is akin more to ma'am or, or something like that. It's a, it's a more of a formal way to address her. And, and actually, what's interesting, um, every time you read the Bible, you're reading a translation. Did you know that? Even if you're reading in the original Greek and Hebrew, because we're passing it through our own translation culturally or you know, our own worldview, our own kind of idea of how our parents have raised us. And so we need to be careful. Whenever you read something that doesn't quite sound right, I, I have this, this default, my kind of default mode when I'm reading the Bible is, if I disagree with something, it's because I'm wrong, okay? So have that default, that's really good. Why? Because the Bible's the inspired, breathed word of God. But I want to encourage you, don't just, don't just read your Bible with tipex. We do that, don't we? We have a highlighter and a tipex, and we read God is love, and we highlight it. We're like, yeah, God is love, that's great. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. I like that verse. And then we get to the bit that says, like, you know, because God, you know, disciplines those he loves. And we get our Tipex out, don't we? And we're like, Tipex, you know, before long, we've got this redacted version of the Bible where we've highlighted all the stuff we agree with and we tipex all the stuff that we don't agree with, right? Anyone else do that? No, you guys are just like, no, I just, you know, taking the full counsel of scripture. I don't. We all do that, don't we? We all do that. And, and I want to challenge you. Abby and I have been on this little journey, and we've done this with our, with our small group. We've been going through all the verses we find really hard. And kind of, we did a study, didn't we, on, um, uh, you know, he, he disciplines those he loves, you know, and he chastises those he loves. And if you haven't been disciplined by God, you're not a son of God. And that might be great on first reading. But I want to I wanna have that heart that says, if I disagree with the Bible, it's because I'm wrong and I need to learn something new. And actually, this translation isn't very good. Where he says, woman, it's a formal thing. And, and, and it's the same word that's used when he's on the cross. And he says to Mary, woman, your son. And he says to John, hmm, son, your mother. It's, it's a formal way of, of addressing her. But actually what he's doing here, he's distinguishing himself um, you know, up until this point, he'd been Jesus, the son of Mary. He'd been, you know, just the carpenter from Nazareth. The carpenter. Luke's training to be a carpenter. It's going to be awesome. And then he's going to train to make guitars, and he's going to make me a beautiful one. Prophetic word. And then, um, so, <laughs> just weigh that and test it, but it's right. Um, the, the, what he's doing here is he's, you know, he... He's, he's not yet stepped into the, the role and ministry of the Messiah. But what he's doing here is disassociating himself from Mary as his mother. Because for a Jewish boy, you know, he would respect his mother. There, there would be that, that you know, that, def, that deferential kind of thing. And we, we do see that later on when he, when, he, when he does what she says. But, you know, there's, this, there's something that's happening here. And what he's doing is disassociating himself as 
the boy from Nazareth and associating himself with the Messiah. And so to, 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 to refer to her as mother would have, would have communicated that. But to say woman, it's a formal, it's a respectful phrase. It's like saying madam in English or ma'am in America. Ma'am, ma'am, I was just in America. Was, you know, I, feel, I feel like, my, I, feel like I, I, went, I went somewhere and I ordered something with fries and then I was like, Ugh, you know, get it out. Chips, I want chips. And I'm wearing trousers, not pants. And, you know, it... it it's a, it's a formal kind of respectful way to say woman. But actually we see that he reinforces that where he says, my time has not yet come. And so he's, what he's communicating here is a bit like uh, the ministry of the forerunner as John the Baptist had to decrease when the ministry of the Messiah came. When John said, you must increase, I must decrease. In the same way, he's kind of giving this idea, this clue that I'm, I'm not speaking to you as my mother right now. I, I'm referring to you as woman because my, 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 my time of being your son, of, of having that you know, familiar connection, of course he never stopped being her son, but he was, he was demonstrating that actually it's time, you know, there is a time coming where I'm going to be Messiah, not Jesus, son of Mary, son of Joseph. Does that make sense? And so let's, let's just, again, you know, where he says, what, uh, what, what concern is it of mine? What concern is it of mine? It's actually the same phrase that the demoniac uses when, when, he says, when they say to Jesus, what do you want with us? And actually what that phrase means, it's, it's not saying this isn't my concern. What Jesus is actually saying here is your concern and my concern are different. We have a different view. We have a different, um, our views are not, are not in alignment. And just in the same way that the demoniac said, or the demon speaking through the demoniac said, what do you want with us? It's that same phrase. And really what it means is what, what you're worried about and what I'm worried about are two different things. And what he's demonstrating here is, and this is as we unpack this, as we go deeper in this, in this miracle, it's really not about the wine. It, he's showing us a much deeper truth. He's showing us a much deeper uh, mission and, and, and mandate for him as the Messiah. Okay, the mission and mandate of Messiah. That's nice. It's got kind of nice alliteration to it. He's demonstrating when he says woman, what, what concern is this to me? What he's actually saying is, woman, you know, I respect you, but, but you're not my mother. I'm the, I'm the Messiah. I have something to do here. And your concern and my concern are different. And I just felt to pull that out just because it's interesting, kind of seeing that the water and the wine are really not the concern. There's a bigger picture being revealed to those who have eyes to see it and those who have ears to hear it. And so as we dig deeper into this, why don't you put your hand on your heart and just say, God, would you give me eyes to see? Would you give me ears to hear? Something fresh. And the key line here is, my hour has not yet come. And there's a, there's a symbolic layering going on here. So the, the hour is really interesting. Um, later on in, jo- in uh, uh, is it Luke or John? Where are we? I think it is later on in John. Yeah, it is John. Um, the, the hour even is really symbolic. My hour has not yet come. It's really interesting how then later on in John 3, we see the account of Nicodemus. And it's interesting that the, the person who comes to uh, Jesus in the dark, the, the, the dark hours is full of ignorance. He's, you know, he, he said, and I, I preached on this a few weeks ago, you know, you're the teacher of Israel, yet you can't even understand this. Yet we see the next chapter in John 4, the woman who comes to Jesus in the light of the day receives enlightening. And so there's this, this theme that John's unpacking, you know, coming, coming to Jesus in ignorance or coming to him in the light and having something revealed about him that you didn't first see at first glance all of which lead up to the hour of Messiah, which is, of course, the cross. That's where it's all heading. That's the, the point of the ministry, the reconciliation ministry of Jesus. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And I love that, the faith of Mary there. That's a good take-home point. Do you know, she, she didn't go to Jesus for the solution. She went to Jesus as the solution. And I think so often we do that. We go to God for the solution instead of going to God as the solution. He's the solution. Jesus doesn't know the solution or have the solution. He is the solution. There's not a single prayer or problem that you're dealing with in your life where Jesus is not the answer. Yeah? Jesus is the answer to every question, isn't it? Yeah? Who do we need more of? Who died for you? What time is it? See? Right? It works. And so the, the, the faith of Mary here, you know, she doesn't actually wait for an answer. I love that. She doesn't wait for an answer. She goes and she says, they have no more wine. And then he says, what is it to do with me? Your concern and my concern are not the same. And then she goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. There's a rhema word for you right now. Just turn to your neighbor and say, do whatever Jesus tells you. Jesus doesn't have the solution. He is the solution. Verse six, you tracking with me in your Bibles? Verse six, 
Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So these stone jars, they represented, they were, they were used for, for the cleansing for, 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 for religious purposes, and they, they represented purification. Okay, and what Jesus is showing here, and we're going to unpack this as we go through the next few verses, what Jesus is demonstrating here that he is taking the law and he's making it better. Because the, the Jews had the law, didn't they? You remember that? Where, where they said, we don't want relationship with God. Give us a law. Give us rules we can keep. And so God gave the law through Moses, didn't he, on the mount? Wrote with the finger of God into the tablets. You guys remember that? Yeah? <laughs> okay, good. Just this is how, yeah, if you know something and you agree, just let's practice this. Just nod your head. If you disagree... <laughs> Where's, is Nick here, Nick Holmes? <laughs> there was once where I couldn't remember. There was once where I couldn't, I was talking, I was preaching on heresy, and I couldn't think of the word heresy. And I was like, and this is a, what is it? What's that word? And Nick shouted out, heresy! <laughs> like that. And I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> it's probably not the thing you want someone from the congregation to point and shout, but he was helping me out, so it was all good. So the stone jars, they're, they're, representing, uh, they're representing purification. And, and there's a prophetic picture, isn't there, in the Old Testament. In Exodus 17, 6, God tells Moses to strike the rock and the water will flow out. Do you remember that? And that's another prophetic picture. We, we covered this when we did our series on Jesus in the Old Testament. There's lots of things that happen in the Old Testament that are a prophetic foreshadow. They're called type sometimes or analogous service where something happens in the Old Testament which is a prophetic picture of what Christ will later do for us. Okay? And this is one of those instances. The rock was a prophetic picture of Christ. Christ the solid rock. Okay? He's, that's one of the names of, 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 of how, we, how we address him. You know, Jesus the rock. And it was a prophetic picture. 1 Corinthians 10.4 tells us that Jesus was that rock. And so think of it, um, you know, when, when the rock was struck and that water poured out, think of it uh, of Jesus on the cross when they, when they thrust the spear into his side, what flowed out of the side of him? Blood and water. And again, we see that kind of that prophetic fulfillment of, of what was to happen, that purification by water, the blood and the water, which both have important meaning in the law. That's something we need to understand when we look at this. Uh, they, they represented justification and sanctification. So uh, two big words there. Justification is, is your sin being, being paid for. And the way to remember that, you've been justified, the way to remember that is it's just if I'd never sinned. That's what justified means. I know, right? Clever, yeah? Uh, substitutionary atonement and the way to the way to think of atonement is break it down at one month it's uh, atonement is about being brought back to god so at one month atonement and justification is justified never sinned so that's justification and that happens by the blood okay we're justified by the blood of christ amen Anyone not believe that? Come and see me afterwards. We will get you saved. You're going to go to heaven. It's going to be amazing. But there's also the sanctification. So blood is for the remission and the water is for the regeneration. It's uh, the blood's for the atonement and the water represents the purification. Uh, and it's that idea of salvation and sanctification. Salvation is you've accepted Jesus. You're saved. You're going to heaven. If you get knocked down by a bus tomorrow and you die, you're going to heaven. That's salvation. But there's a process that we go through called sanctification. And that is the process of becoming more Christ-like. It's the process of, you know, abiding in him. You know, he is the vine, we're the branches. If we abide in him, we produce good fruit. You know, sanctification, the fruit is the evidence that you're being sanctified. You're being made more like him. And so for, for Jesus to take these stone jars, which were used for the ceremonial washing, we need to pay attention because he's demonstrating something that he's about to communicate about the law, which is right and just and true, yeah? Nothing that God gives is, is wrong, okay? Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. He came to make it complete, okay? And so the, 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 the blood and the water, there's, there's so much symbolism going on here. And when we take communion, the, you know, the, it's symbolic of the blood of Jesus, isn't it? For, you know, celebrating what he did on the cross, the salvation. But when we get baptized, it's symbolic. It's the water. It's the purification. It's that process of, you know, we're, we're saved, but we also need to be sanctified, because you don't look all like Jesus right now, do you? I don't look like Jesus. Just ask my wife. She will tell you 101 ways in the last week that I have not looked like Jesus. So we all need to go on this process of being made more like him so that we can be that lamb, uh, to be that bride without blemish. Yeah? To be like him because he's the lamb without blemish and we're going to be the bride without blemish. Why don't you just close your eyes a second and just thank Jesus that he saved you. But also thank him that he has committed to you as you walk out this process of sanctification. And so in communion, we see the symbolism of the wine as the blood of Jesus. But also as we remember that he shed his blood instead of ours, 
we can enjoy the new wine of the kingdom. And so there's a dual thing going on. We didn't have to give our own blood because he gave his blood. So we get to enjoy the new wine. And that second time when Moses was told to, to speak to the rock, do you remember that? And he struck it instead. And actually, Rob was telling me about this this morning. I didn't realize this. But that second time where he was told to speak to the rock, that was a prophetic picture of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to prophesy for that second uh, living water to be, to be poured out. I didn't realize that. It was really interesting. So the jars that are used for ceremonial washing, what's interesting as well is how many there were. You know, nothing in the Bible is there by accident. It's all the breathed word of God, you know? And so everything has meaning. Everything, there's, there's layer upon layer of truth. You know, there's degrees of truth. You know, all, not all truth is created equal. Did you know that? Because it's line upon line, precept upon precept. Okay, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love, okay? So there's, 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 there's ascending order of truth, and we see that there's layers of meaning here as we dig a bit deeper, as we, as we diligently pursue him and diligently seek after him. There's more and more to be seen. The number six symbolizes man and it symbolizes human weakness. Slaves in the old covenant were, they served six years and were released on the seventh year. God assigned man to work for six days and then the seventh day is the day of rest. So the number six symbolizes the work of man. Don't tell your boss that God assigned six days of work. Five days is just fine by me. But yeah, I hope Stu and Chloe aren't listening to this podcast because then they'll be like, six days? That's amazing. But you know, it symbolizes the work of man and the law of Moses, um, it the whole point of the law was it was to demonstrate that we needed a savior. That was the whole point of the law was to show us that even in our best efforts, even in our best efforts to keep the law, all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? Because there is none righteous, no, not one. Yeah, all have fallen short of the glory. And so in this old covenant, you're, you're doing your best to, to get to God, you know, to, to, to keep the law and to, to be purified. You needed to be purified because you understood that because you'd broken the law, you were, you, were, you were dirty, okay? And, and, and all through the Old Testament, we see these, these processes of symboli- you know, symbolic uh, gestures that, that they purified themselves before God to be able to, to stand before God. And so we see, don't we, that the Passover lamb, you know, and, and all of these um, rituals and sacrifices that had to happen, the blood that had to be spilt to, to atone for the sin of man, okay? And in the Old Covenant, you're, you're dirty, you're fundamentally dirty, and you're trying your best to be clean. And what Jesus is ushering in here is the new covenant. So in the old covenant, you're dirty and you're trying your best to make yourself clean. In the new covenant, you're fundamentally clean and you're trying your best not to become dirty. A better way to say it would be get dirty, not be dirty. Because some of you need to hear that you're a new creation. You can never be dirty again. You can get dirty. Put it this way. Before you're saved, the dirt is in you. After you're saved, the dirt's on you. And that's why Jesus, when he washed the feet of the disciples, and, and then they say, like, wash the whole of me. And he's like, no, 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 you've, you've been washed once. And, and the, the, the symbolism there was, you know, we pick up dirt on our feet as we go through life, but we never have to be washed from top to bottom again. Too many of us are trying to be washed from top to bottom again. We're trying to earn our way back in. We're trying to go back under the law. And someone here tonight needs to know that you're not a bad person trying to be good. You are a good person trying not to be bad. Someone needs to hear that. Am I preaching to anyone? I'm preaching to me. <laughs> this new covenant that Jesus is showing us is holy and in every way superior to the old covenant. Hebrews 8 would be a, a great example of that. And in Hebrew, the number six stands for incompleteness and imperfection. And seven is the number of completion and perfection, okay? And so the, it's no mistake, it's no small detail that is insignificant to the story that the, the pots were used for the ceremonial washing and there were six of them which represented imperfection and man's best efforts. And so we see here Jesus is, that's why he's saying your concern and my concern are not the same. Because Mary's concern was about the wine, it was about the, the banquet, it was about the, you know, the family not having shame because they'd run out of wine. And Jesus is like, your concern and my concern are completely different. You're thinking about wine, I'm thinking about the new covenant. Six jars that represented to the, the, the mindset of the day, we have to purify ourselves. We have to make ourselves clean. And in this miracle, Jesus is symbolically replacing the Jewish law that was powerless to save with the late appearance of the more excellent and powerful gospel. Just turn to your neighbor and say, this is a gospel of power. So we've got our six jars. The jars represent what? What do the jars represent? Yeah, the, the, the rep, they represent the ritual of having to purify yourself to come to God. What does the number six represent? 
yeah, I'm just checking you're tracking with me and not just like, I have no idea what you're saying. Okay, so takes the six jars that represent that. Verse seven, and this is interesting. We need to pay attention to this detail. He says, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water so they filled them to the brim. Everyone know what that means? Literally to the top so that they were literally as full as they can be. And this is really interesting as well because think about this. In the context of what the jars represented, the law, they represented trying to make ourselves clean, trying to, trying to make ourselves uh, righteous before God. And Jesus is demonstrating here what he has come to do. Why? Because he's disassociated himself as Jesus, the son of Mary, and associated himself with, I am here, my hour has not yet come. I'm here to do something. And here's why I'm showing you now what I'm about to do in this new covenant. Fill them to the brim, showing that there's nothing that can be added to this new wine of the kingdom. There's nothing that can be added. They're filled to the brim. Every bit of space left for ritualistic washing was replaced when they were filled to the brim. What he's showing us here, appropriate, that Jesus filled the rituals completely. He fulfilled the law completely. He kept the law perfectly. There was not one jot of the law that he was guilty of breaking. And he was showing us that filled to the brim, the fullness of the law, there's something more. There's something better. There's something better coming. Even when this is fully complete, even when this is fully accomplished, even when this is fully perfect, there's something better that's coming. Filled to the brim. No space left. And then he told them, verse 8, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And you know, as his servants, as the servants of Christ, you and I can draw from him and taste this wine of the new covenant. And they did so, verse 9, and the master of the banquet, I love this, the master of the banquet, I imagine him to be a jolly fellow, probably looked a bit like Brian Blessed or something like that. You know, this kind of MC, this kind of, you know, town crier kind of figure in my head. That's what he looked like. The master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside. And you know, under the law, Moses turned water into blood. Do you remember that? The, 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 um, the, the Nile. Yeah, thank you. That huge river that's really famous that I could not think of. Heresy. What, what's that word? Heresy. No, the Nile. He, you know, in, in the old covenant, um, Moses, who was a messianic foreshadow he was a a, a a picture wasn't he he was a, a the deliverer of Israel and he was and that's called analogous service that's something that someone in the Old Testament does that Jesus later fully does perfectly so Moses was a was a was a type he was a kind of picture of what Jesus would be by rescuing the people of Israel from their captivity from their slavery and taking them through the waters of baptism into the promised land okay so that's a prophetic picture that we're seeing and in the old covenant the water turned into blood but under grace and the new covenant the water water turns into wine. The head waiter tasted the wine and saw that it was good. And this wine, this covenant of grace, this is a, a covenant of grace that Jesus is telling us. And here's, a, here's, a, here's something I want you to take home to, to think about the grace of God. Because so often, you know, the, the master of the banquet didn't know how good it was until he tasted it. He didn't know how good it was until he tasted it. And in the same way, you don't know how good grace is until you Taste it until you partake of it. You can't know how good it is until you've tasted it. And so often, we want to see something before we taste it, don't we? We want to know that something's good before we take a bite of it, don't we? You know, we're, we're kind of checking it out. We're assessing it. We're, you know, we're looking, you know, we want to see something and we want to we make sure that we like the look of it before we take a bite of it. Yeah? Don't we? But the Bible doesn't say, see and taste that the Lord is good. What does it say? Taste and see. And so we see that picture there of that, 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 that wine that Jesus offers, this, this wine of the new covenant. And so often, you know, we come to this place where, you know, we want to assess something before we take it. We want to weigh it up before we take it. But I don't want to be someone that's, that says, see and taste that the Lord is good. I want to be someone that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. To take that sip of it and to that, that point realize just how good this wine is. Who here can testify to the fact that they didn't know how good grace was until they took a big old drink of it? Come on. Any sinners saved by grace here? What were the rest of you saved by? I'm just curious. <laughs> works, Pastor Tom. We are saved by works. The Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. No, we're, we're, we're saved by grace. We're not saved by works. So Jesus is demonstrating here that this, this, this jar that represented everything about the law, even when it's filled to the brim, he was showing us that even in the perfection of the law, we still, you know, there's only one who could fill that jar to the brim, right? 
Jesus was the only one who could fulfill the law fully. And he was telling us that even, even in this place of law, he's filled it to the brim so there's no space left for anything you could do. There's no space left for anything that you could do to receive what he's about to give you in the wine of the new kingdom. And so to drink that wine, you have to appreciate that the law has been, A, fulfilled fully by Jesus, but B, that you can't add anything to it. And so often we're trying to add works to grace to make our salvation. You know, we're like the son in Luke 15, aren't we? Father, you know, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You know, I'm no longer worthy to, to hold this place as your son by grace. So make me like one of your hired men so that I can work my way back into your affection. Is anyone relating to this? I'm preaching to myself because I do it all the time. I make deals with God. I make bargains with God. And I forget that I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I think that I can add something. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. And now I'm going to work really hard to make sure that my election is sure. There's work to do. Yes, we're prepared. There's works prepared for us in advance. Good works to do. But that's the work of the kingdom, not the work for the kingdom. We need to understand we cannot work for the affection of God. We work from the affection of God. And so when we see that, 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 jar being full we we understand he filled it I could never fill it but there's nothing else I can add to that law to receive this grace someone here needs to hear that tonight there's nothing you can do that's going to make God love you more there's nothing you can do that's going to make God love you less you're a sinner saved by grace 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 and nothing else but grace amen four people are excited by that taste and see that the Lord is good verse 10 everybody brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Do you know your best best is still ahead of you? Save the best till last. You've saved the best till now. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. How do we share in the glory of God? We share in his sufferings. We don't get the glory until we understand that we need to share in the suffering of the cross. We need to understand that we've been crucified with him. You know the problem with living sacrifices, don't you? They tend to crawl off the altar. You need to die. You know God is not the slightest bit interested in making a better version of you. Did you know that? God wants you dead. Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants you dead. <laughs> God wants you dead. Why? Because when you die with him and you die as him, then you are raised with him and raised as him. And that's why you can be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's why you can now pray prayers from heaven to earth, not from earth to heaven. That's why we now understand that we're seated in heavenly places and we have a different perspective on life. We have a different view on life. Our worldview has changed because our placement has changed. But if you're trying to add something to that jar, you've fully misunderstood the concept of grace. If you think you can add anything to what Jesus did on the cross, you fully misunderstood the concept of grace. Grace is the most outrageous thing. There's, a, there's a, a heresy going around at the moment called hyper grace and we changed it to hyper grace because people were calling it extreme grace and we're like, actually extreme grace is a pretty accurate example of grace. Grace is extreme. Grace is a scandal. Karma says you sin, you pay. Grace says you sin, he pays. It's a scandal that the, the sinless son of God would be killed for what you did. That's a scandal. It's extreme. And for any of us who think we can add anything to what Jesus has done to earn our salvation, you fully misunderstood the concept, the purpose, and the plan of grace in your life. The grace of God is all sufficient. It means you can't add anything to it. This is the new wine of the kingdom. Verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and they stayed for a few days. That's a nice little detail on the end. <sighs> the anointing that flows at the level of grace is only going to be fully realized and fully received when we understand grace. And this is such a simple concept, but I love how Jesus works in the simple. The gospel is the most complicated thing in the world to understand, but it's the most simple thing in the world to receive. You know, the gospel is the free gift that will cost you everything. I'm just going to ask every single person in the room just to close their eyes for a second. And I want to tell you that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And there's not a single thing any one of us could do about it. We could not make that right. We could not make that right in any way, shape or form. 
You know, I was talking with a Muslim woman this morning who came to church, my little friend, Beanish. She said, what, what would you say is the main difference between all the other religions and your religion? And I said this, I said, every other religion calls for men to go and die for God. But my religion is the only religion where God came and died for men. That's the grace of God. The completely unmerited, undeserved gift of eternal life in him. And not just eternal life in him, but the kingdom of God right here, right now. Not pie in the sky by and by, but steak on the plate while you wait. We live in a now and not yet kingdom. And so with every eye closed, I just want to offer an invitation for anyone tonight who, hearing this tonight, you have understood that you have fallen short of the glory of God. And honestly, you don't know where you stand before God. And I want to tell you tonight that when you accept Jesus as your personal saviour, when you believe in your heart that he died for you and you confess with your mouth that he died for you and that he rose again for you. The Bible says when you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, that's it. You're saved and you will be with him for eternity. And if you've never done that, I want to invite you to do that this evening. It is the most amazing gift. You don't know how good this wine is until you take a good old swig of it. And when you drink that wine, you understand that Jesus came to give life and give it in abundance. John 10.10. 10. The devil came to seek, to kill and destroy you. But Jesus came that you would have life and have it in abundance. And so for anyone here tonight who hasn't made that decision, and we're going to do some ministry for others as well, but with every eye closed, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. The, 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 the way to tell if your eyes are not closed is if you can still see. That would indicate that your eyes are still open. With every eye closed, if that is you, if you recognize that you have never given your life to Jesus, that you have never received his gift of eternal life, if you have never believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus died for you and he rose again, I'm going to invite you just to raise your hand. I'm not going to make you do anything weird or silly, but I will come and meet you afterwards and come and pray with you. I'm just going to give a few more seconds if that's you. Okay, and then the second bit of ministry I wanted to do, and we're going to land on this, is I think probably for all of us this would be true to some extent, but if you are really feeling the conviction of God right now that you've been living in a place where you feel like you could add something to that jar, where you knew that you were saved and you believe that you're saved, but you've been trying to work your salvation, you've been like that son in Luke 15 that said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, make me like one of your hired men. If that's you again with every eye closed, I'm just going to ask you just to raise your hand, just if that resonates with you and we're not going to make you do anything weird, don't worry. Thank you. Okay, you can pop your hands down. And the reason I got you to raise your hand is just as a prophetic act. Just imagine yourself reaching up for that cup. Imagine yourself as the master of the banquet that Jesus has taken the law and has fulfilled it in every way and transformed it and made it something so much better than it was before, which is the covenant of grace, the new wine of the kingdom. Just imagine yourself in, in the spiritual realm just reaching out for that cup and taking a big old sip of that wine. And just receive the experiential truth that it tastes amazing. It tastes so good. The grace of God tastes so good. So we're going to have a chance just to respond to that now. If I could just invite our ministry team forward, that would be amazing. Why don't we all stand? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to close the service. But we want to give an invitation tonight just to stand with you in agreement. Uh, and just what I felt God was doing tonight was reminding us how good that grace tastes, how good the grace of God tastes to those who have partaken of it, to those who have drunk of it. And what we're going to do tonight is stand in agreement with you that no longer are you going to work for your salvation. No longer are you going to work for your approval. No longer are you going to work to try and make full what Jesus has done for you. And as, as for those people who put their hands up or for anyone else who feels like they want to respond, ministry team, if you could just come forward, that'd be great. Just so people don't feel awkward walking forward. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Some ministry team are up here. Just come and make yourself known. We're just going to have a soft close, but we really want to pray for you. We really believe that we are a ministry that understands the grace of God, but we know that we have more to understand. We haven't fully grasped the infinite concept of grace. So if you want to come and just respond, just come forward. The ministry team are just going to move around and pray for you. But Just as you come forward, just make that decision that you're going to take another drink of that good wine that Jesus made to understand that the fullness of God and the grace of God is all you're ever going to need in your life. There's nothing that those six jar clays could ever do for you that Jesus hasn't already done for you. So guys, just come forward. If we could have some music, that'd be amazing. So I'm just going to pray just as you guys come forward. So Jesus, we thank you that you are the word, that you are the lamb, but you are also the bridegroom. Jesus, we thank you that there is going to be a wedding and it is the reason that we're living and we are going to marry the lamb, but we want to be a bride who prepares herself fully for that day. We want to be eagerly eagerly awaiting your return, calling you, you know, that, that cry of Maranatha, you know, come Lord Jesus, but God, we want to make ourselves ready. We want to be a people who are fully prepared for your return. And Jesus, we understand that part of that process is becoming more like you. And the only way we can do that is by grace, God. We thank you for your grace, God. We thank you for your grace. Why don't we all just symbolically just take a, as a prophetic act, let's just take that cup in our hands and just remind ourselves of that cup of grace, that new wine of the kingdom. And just let's, don't worry if you feel silly, that's what prophetic acts are for, is to get you out of pride and what other people think of you and connect you with God. And just take a sip of that cup and just thank God as you do that you're drinking of the new wine of the kingdom you are drinking of grace you are not under the law anymore you're under the grace of God so Jesus we thank you for your grace we thank you for your blood poured out we thank you for your full work of atonement in that in that you died in our place you died for us you died as us God we thank you so bless us this week we ask Father would you Make your face to shine upon us. Jesus, would you receive the glory in us and through us this week? And Holy Spirit, would you just be so free to move in us and about us and through us? We commit ourselves this week to sharing in your suffering so that we can too share in your glory, so that you would get the full reward, Jesus. So fill us up, we ask, Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, bless you guys there's ministry team available if you want to come forward just come forward and just start receiving and the ministry team are going to work their way around but other than that we bless you to have an amazing week thank you for being with us if you're new here and you want to come and meet someone Ellie Barrett is the lovely lady with the colourful hair here she would love to meet you and get to know you and tell you how you can get more connected if you want to find out more about the school of ministry come and talk to Philly if she's around or anyone else who vaguely looks like they know what they're doing Bless you guys. Amen.